Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so glad you are able to uh, to make it this morning. I want to welcome our audience uh, from all over the uh, the country and possibly the world. And a special nod to uh, my brother, who I noticed uh, uh, signed up for the event, uh, an Afghan vet himself. Uh, so really pleased to to have you all here. Um, we're here today uh, with the author of uh, this book, The Hardest Place, uh, Wesley Morgan. Um, Wes, if you don't mind me calling you that, uh, covered uh, the Pentagon beat for Politico, um, where I first became familiar with his reporting as he was one of the, really the only journalists uh, helping uh, the American public understand the nature of uh, special operations forces and, and the special authorities that had been operating under uh, in Africa for the last couple of years. Uh, but before that stint, um, he had spent several years um, reporting inside and outside of Iraq and Afghanistan on those wars, uh, covering them a lot of times from the perspective of those doing uh, the fighting. Uh, and his work has appeared in all sorts of publications that the audience will be familiar with, uh, from the Washington Post and New York Times uh, to the Atlantic. Um, the book uh, we're here to talk about today, uh, The Hardest Place, um, I'll just say this, if you haven't read this book or don't have a copy of it yet, uh, I'm really hoping today's conversation uh, convinces you to go out and get a copy and, and, to, and to read it from uh, cover to cover, uh, including the epilogue. Um, this is a book, unlike any before it, uh, of which I'm aware, about the American experience in Afghanistan, uh, much of it told through detailed episodes of, of military operations uh, in the Pesh and Korangal Valleys in eastern Afghanistan. Um, and it has some of the most detailed accounts of the firefights and operations that have occurred in that, that area in Afghanistan. Um, and it's chock full of stories of both incredible valor, uh, but also tragedy. Uh, but what I love about the book is that Wes has really uh, woven together, um, you know, the episodes in the book and the stories it tells of soldiers and Afghans, um, a lot of times from per first person accounts over a 17 year period, uh, into a broader narrative about the war itself. And in my mind, raises some really important questions uh, and poses uh, some hard truths that all Americans uh, should really be compelled to reflect upon and think about. Um, and of course, this discussion today takes place at a moment that's um, you know challenging and possibly you know and, and probably difficult for a lot of, of people in Afghanistan, certainly, uh, and in the United States uh, who have experience in Afghanistan, uh, as we all wrestle with the decision to withdraw uh, U.S. forces. And I'm sure we'll have some time to talk about that. Um, I and I think we are so lucky to be joined today also by Missy Ryan, um, who is the Pentagon and defense reporter from the Washington Post, uh, who herself has done an amazing job uh, covering, among many other things, uh, not only the Pentagon and, and military policy, but specifically uh, military, the military civilian casualties uh, you know, pro policy and process, uh, one of the few that's keeping uh, light on that subject. Um, and we're so grateful for the work she's done. If you missed her article with uh, Mustafa Salim and Harry Stevens, um, co-produced with Air Wars uh, from December in the post last year, uh, called Behind the Tally, Names and Lives, uh, you really need to find it and read it. And we'll post it in the chat so that you can uh, you can recall it. So uh, we're gonna talk today with Wes. We're gonna try to keep things a little bit loose and informal and conversational. Um, and we'll go back and forth on some questions. Uh, Wes has also graciously uh, suggested that we allow audience questions. Uh, towards the end of the event, and he's also uh, graciously volunteered to stick around uh, for 15 minutes when we conclude uh, at 11 o'clock to, to let that conversation continue, even though I think Missy has another obligation. Of course, Missy, you're welcome uh, to stay. Um, Wes, before we, Missy and I get started with the questions about the content of the book itself, I wonder if you could, uh, for our audience, um, just kind of situate the geography of where the book takes place and why you focused on it and why it was so important uh, to the U.S. military uh, at the outset of the war. Sure. Um, so the place we're talking about, the Pesh Valley and its tributaries, some more famous places like the Korangal and Weigal Valleys, um, it's about 100 miles northeast of Kabul. Um, it kind of stretches along the border between Kunar and Nuristan provinces, uh, which are two provinces where a, a lot of the worst of the, some of the worst of the fighting of the war for U.S. troops took place. Um, and U.S. troops went up there for reasons that, you know, when I first went to the patch in 2010 were not obvious to me or to most of the troops who were stuck in the valley fighting there at that point. Um, but, you know, what I discovered in the course of reporting out this book um, was that uh, U.S. troops had first come up to this part of the country way back in the spring of 2002, about six months after 9-11, uh, initially for the very narrow purpose of um, trying to figure out where bin Laden had gone after he escaped at Tora Bora. Uh, and, and this was sort of the trail of bin Laden led the CIA and the Joint Special Operations Command in kind of very small numbers of little covert commando teams um, 
up to set up their first base in the area. And then from there, things kind of snowballed. That's great. Well, I think I'll, with that, I think I'm gonna jump in with the first question. And I'll just say, Wes, how much I enjoyed the book. And um, I learned so much about uh, the way this unfolded on a sort of uh, infantry level and uh, uh, the tactical level. And also, you know, for me, it really encapsulated some of the challenges that the United States has faced across Afghanistan, but also in counterinsurgent conflicts um, in other places, um, I think. And that's building off of that, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was the confluence of two factors I think a lot of us on this um, call today will be familiar with. And one is which, one is the sort of iterative nature of this long conflict. Um, you know, people always say that it's not a 10 year war or 20 year war in Afghanistan. It's a 10 year, it's a um, one year war fought 10 times or 20 times. Um, and it was interesting for me to see the different um, characters of personalities, um, but also units and um, the different um, impulses that were driven by the, the um, iterative commands in Kabul and what that brought um, to the fight. And so you have that. And then there was another impulse, which um, Dan was uh, pointing out as we were getting ready for this event. And that was, um, you know, I think the, the impulse that the US military has always and everywhere um, is to do something that, that each commander and each uh, iterative unit that was in um, the Pesh felt like they had to, and in Kabul felt like they had to act um, uh, and not always with um, the right information. So I'd love if you could talk a little bit about how those two um, factors uh, came together in the Pesh. You know, the fact that um, there wasn't always informa uh, information being conveyed between successive units. Um, and then also people felt like they needed to try different things. Um, uh, and again, not always with the right information. Thanks. Sure, yeah. So. Um... Uh, and thanks so much for your kind words about the book and for for reading it. I really appreciate it. But yeah, as you as you say, I mean, one of the one of the themes that you see across the war in the patch, and I think throughout Afghanistan, is that very often uh, the way the mission expanded from this narrow counterterrorism mission uh, at, at the beginning to the very expansive counterinsurgency and nation building mission later on was not with big, broad policy decisions. Although those did occur, um, you know, about the Obama administration surge, for instance. Uh, but in the patch, it was really very often in little tiny increments as units rotated in and out, um, as a new unit arrived and then a new unit arrived after that, each one would um, embrace a slightly more expansive version of the previous unit's mission uh, without you know, necessarily understanding what that unit's starting point had been because there's so little sort of time to absorb knowledge during these like two week turnovers that these units would have with one another. Um, so I'll give the example of the Korengal Valley um, which is a place where in 2006, the military sort of surged into the Korengal Valley and built an outpost there. Um, and the first unit to live in the Korengal Valley, which is a unit from the 10th Mountain Division, their concept of the Korengal uh, was kind of that it was a place where they were fighting irreconcilable insurgents to kind of keep those insurgents away from the Pesh Valley floor nearby. Uh, so that the sort of the, the good work of development and counterinsurgency and nation building could occur on the Pesh Valley floor. Um, and as part of this, they started building a road into the Korengal for the very narrow purpose of, you know, having a ground supply route that is safer from IEDs. You know, this unit stays there for 16 months. A new unit from the 173rd Airborne Brigade replaces them. And the kind of the nuance of we're doing X in the Korengal to protect our ability to do Y in the Pesh uh, is lost on this new unit. And this new unit takes on a much more expansive approach in both places uh, with the idea that it's kind of going to expand the writ of the Afghan government and bring development and nation building, not just to the patch, but also into the Korengal. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's sort of a subtle shift that uh, was probably not really obvious at the time, um, but that in retrospect, you can see this was a step um, into, into a, you know, a, a far more ambitious and far too ambitious um, approach uh, in, in the Pesh Valley and its tributaries. Um, the, the road building effort was really evocative of the um, somewhat ephemeral nature of our presence there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, the roads are something that it will be really interesting to see. I mean, I haven't been up to Kunar in, in, in a while, in a few years, but um, 
you know, what what is the state of those roads, I think, is kind of one of the things that we'll want to grade the U.S. effort on in the long term. Um, but talking a little bit about kind of the what, you know, what the military sometimes calls like the bias for action. I mean, I think it is built into the DNA of uh, Army and Marine combat units that you have to act. Um, and it makes sense. I mean, if you think about sort of what these units are built for and exist for, um, inaction can be really deadly for, for military units in the kind of, you know, big conflicts that they are uh, that they are structured for. Um, but in places like Kunar, uh, very often uh, acting uh, wound up creating, you know, very, very negative blowback. Um, there's a guy named David Katz who is quoted in the book, a former foreign service officer uh, who described, he's a guy who actually who knew this area really, really well, probably better than almost anyone in the American national security establishment because he'd actually done his, his anthropology PhD field work in the Weigall Valley north of the Pesh in the 1970s. He speaks the language, the sort of very unique language of that little valley. Um, but something that he described to me was that uh, basically the, the, the longer you spend in a place like the Petch, uh, the more you realize that you have no idea what the second and third order consequences of anything you do are going to be. Um, and he describes the cultural clash between sort of his understanding of that fact and the reality for the battalion commanders that he was working with, uh, these you know lieutenant colonels in charge of 700 infantrymen, uh, that that's just that's just not how they operate. Sitting back and waiting for the perfect information, they're never going to have the perfect information. Uh, they're only there for 15 months anyway. Um, you know, by the time their 15 months is up, they're going to have some more information, but it's not going to be the perfect information. Um, so you see, you know, these commanders they make decisions based on flawed information. Uh, in some cases, you know, looking at the the plunge into the Petch and the Korangal in 2006, that was known as Operation Mountain Lion. Um, Th that was underpinned by some intelligence that we know now to be incomplete. Um, it, uh, then, then Colonel, uh, now retired General Mick Nicholson, described to me for the book how part of the motivation for going going hard and going big in Kunar in 2006 uh, was that Kunar was the only place in the Afghan East that there was a known Al Qaeda operative, genuine, bona fide, you know, foreign Arab Al Qaeda operative. We know in retrospect from uh, actually from Al Qaeda documents from. Uh, basically martyr biographies that they released years later, that there were quite a few other Al-Qaeda operatives at that time operating in different provinces in the Afghan East, but they weren't known to the U.S. military. You know, General Nicholson and, 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 his, and his subordinates were acting on the information that they had. There are other parts of the book where you see later on, for instance, there's a unit from the 25th Infantry Division that arguably goes back into the patch, um, not with an absence of information, but uh, in opposition to the information that it has. Uh, you know, it has, has the benefit of many units before it that have kind of uh, learned that these kind of tactics don't work and nevertheless it applies them. Uh, and kind of, I think the, the cynical view that a lot of soldiers in that unit had was that um, they had officers in their chain of command who felt like this was their chance to do the Petch thing, to go in and do the big air assaults uh, in, in these valleys where you could get into big fights, uh, even though there were voices below them saying, we've been here before, this doesn't work. Yeah. yeah, thanks. I could I could ask several questions just on the basis of that. But I think one of the most important um, questions that sort of invited by your response, Wes, and also your question in turn, Missy, um, has to really do with sort of you, you know, what what was the US actually doing there? What was the purpose of the presence? And, you know, you know, as I read the book, um, you know, the longer I kind of got through it, you, you kind of use this recurring theme almost. And I think at one point you even refer specifically to the metaphor of, uh, of a body rejecting a foreign object because ostensibly the US was there uh, to fight Al Qaeda, but as the US presence kind of started and then grew over time, not only did you lose this uh, kind of a sense of who the US precisely was fighting, which you went into a little bit before, uh, when they, at least as far as anybody knew, there were only a couple of Al Qaeda uh, in the region until they, they figured out later that that may not have actually been the case. Um, but who they were fighting seemed to have a much more local character than a, than a foreign character. And it almost feels like, you know, building on what Missy said, like the desire to do something not only created uh, the impulse to expand the enemy list, but also may have cultivated, you know, a resistance uh, to its presence there. Um, and I couldn't help but recall um, there are a couple of lines in the book about, you know, asking whether or not, you know, the U.S. forces were the honey or the or the bees. Um, and it really reminded me of um, a line from John Steinbeck's book, The Moon is Down. You know, this, the flies had conquered the fly pep paper. Um, and I felt like that was sort of the case at some stages of uh, of our presence there. 
But I wonder if you could offer some reflections, you know, about the kind of chicken and egg um, sequence between keeping an international presence uh, like, you know, Al Qaeda out of Afghanistan, but at the same time uh, fomenting, um, you know, a much more localized form of insurgency. Um, and also just offer some thoughts on what you think the net effect of U.S. forces and the presence, the sustained presence, the semi-permanent presence of U.S. forces uh, was uh, in the region. Sure. You know, I'll start with Depeche specifically. Kind of the, the ironic arc of the story up there is that U.S. forces went up there for the narrow purpose of looking for al-Qaeda leaders like Osama bin Laden. They didn't find him there because um, they were, you know, kind of too far behind the scent. Um, U.S. forces stayed. Uh, their presence actually kind of created popular resistance as U.S. forces detained the wrong people, killed people by mistake. Uh, and so this is a province where the Taliban really had not existed in, in, uh, in any extensive form before 2001. This is not the Taliban heartland. It's, uh, it's a place of sort of Salafi groups that actually in many cases had fought against the Taliban. Um, but as they start to resist the U.S. presence, um, that draws the Taliban in. Uh, the Taliban sees, okay, so this is a, this is a place that the U.S., uh, that the U.S. is fighting and where there's popular resistance that we can capitalize on. And so the Taliban, in effect, kind of takes over or hijacks this, this local Kunari insurgency. And then as the, as the combat between the U.S. and this sort of local Taliban um, escalates over the years, that conflict and the ferocity of it actually draws in the very Al-Qaeda Arabs who the U.S. went there looking for. Um, there's a guy named Farouk al Qatani who became a, you know, a, a pretty uh, uh, elusive uh, and very high value target for the U.S. military for years in Afghanistan, really their number one Al-Qaeda target for years before he was finally killed in 2016 in the drone strike. Um, and we know that when he first came uh, to the patch, it was around 2009 at the peak of the sort of day to day slugging it out um, between U.S. troops and local insurgents. And that Farouk came there basically because it was a good place to fight. Um, a lot of foreign fighters came there because it had become a good place to fight and a good place to gain battlefield experience and a good place to film propaganda videos. Um, so it, you know, in a sense, by kind of uh, interfering in local conflicts and creating local conflicts, um, the U.S. brought in the very enemies uh, that the very kind of the foreign and international enemies uh, that it had gone there seeking to find when they actually weren't really there. Wes, I'd like to ask you about, uh, there's uh, one operation that you focus on um, to some extent in the book, and um, it's something that many of the, the people on the call may be familiar with, and that's um, Red Wings in 2005, um, and there was a, a book and then a movie based on this operation. Uh, and I'm just hoping you can summarize for us a little bit about what you learned about Red Wings. And I think, you know, for me, the the um, there were a couple of striking factors um, in reading about um, that, and and then more, uh, and then the larger sort of um, interactions between you know the JSOC CT operation um, and then the um, the mil other military presence and oper and you know iterative operation in the Pesh, and one of them was the extent to which um, there was uh, this compartmented. Uh, uh, activity between the JSOC operators and um, the other troops in the Pesh, and they didn't really know what was going on. And, and then also um, sort of the cultural clash um, that occurred and, um, and concerns about the way civilians were treated by um, the, the operators. And I'm hoping you can talk to us a little bit about all of that. Yeah, sure. I mean, so Red Wings is an episode that's very famous um, you know, as a result of the, the memoir and the, and the movie that came out of it. Um, it's also an extremely controversial episode because there is a lot of misinformation and exaggeration um, that exists in various accounts surrounding what happened during Red Wings and what Red Wings was and why it happened. Um, you know, what I think are the most important um, themes that I took away from it are, one, um, that it was kind of an example of special operations forces uh, going and looking for trouble. Um, they were looking for, they were going after a fairly small time insurgent commander, um, uh, you know, a local guy, not at Korangali, but a guy from the next valley south of the Korangal. Um, and he, in the course of this operation, um, overruns a small SEAL reconnaissance team, kills three out of four guys, 
and then brings down, shoots down a Chinook helicopter full of special operators that comes to find them. Um, and this is at a point where actually very few US lives uh, relative to you know, what we would eventually see had been lost in Afghanistan. And so the, the 19 guys killed on this day, June 28th of 2005, it actually increases by about 25% the total US death toll in Afghanistan up to this point. Um, and it has this effect, this unintended effect of um, hugely increasing the, uh, uh, basically the cachet uh, of this particular insurgent leader. Um, he, he, he had been a small time guy and he becomes a big time guy. He becomes a, a bright flashing light for JSOC and the CIA. Uh, and, and his presence actually then continues to uh, draw U.S. forces up there. I mean, when the 10th Mountain Division commits forces on a large scale a year later, um, part of their calculus is Ahmed Shah, this high value target, um, is up there and we need to get him. Um, as you say, I mean, another of the big themes is um, Red Wings is, a, is a, a really perfect example of the way that the various tribes of the U.S. military and, and U.S. counterterrorism effort were not talking to each other. They were they were compartmentalized. Uh, and they had tunnel vision, and they just would not clue each other in on what they were doing. Uh, this is part of why Red Wings came to grief. Um, it was a you know one tribe of special operations forces uh, that was operating kind of in collaboration with conventional forces to a to a degree, but without really sharing a lot of information with them. Uh, when the helicopter is shot down, the other tribe of special operations forces doesn't even know uh, that the mission has been launched. Um, and so it, there becomes this kind of cascading tragedy of, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's caused in large part uh, by these units kind of not coordinating with each other and not being on the same page. Um, you also see this during the rescue effort. You see, you know, there's JSOC, there's the CIA, there's the Green Berets, there's Conventional Army and Marines, uh, and they're all uh, kind of working in the same area, sometimes working at cross purposes with each other. Uh, and, and this is a theme that you see throughout the Afghan war. Now, in some ways, the military does over time, you know, learn from this over a, a long period of time. Um, it, it kind of manages to integrate conventional and special operations efforts better um, in, in Afghanistan. In particular, you know, not as a result of Red Wings exactly, but years later in 2008 and 2009, uh, then Vice Admiral Bill McRaven, um, who was the commander of the Joint Special Operations Command, uh, you know, a, a SEAL veteran himself on whom Red Wings, I believe, had an impact. Um, he in 2009 kind of tells the JSOC task force, we need to get our act together. We need to, we need to coordinate better with conventional forces. Uh, and that's in part because uh, by that point in the war, there had been, uh, you know, the pace of JSOC raids had increased a lot. More and more, they were going after these small time figures in these nightly raids out in, in rural districts. Um, and you saw uh, in, in late 2008 and early 2009, there were a series of, of, of really bad civilian casualty incidents involving special operations night raids. Uh, and these really shook Admiral McRaven and they shook um, the ambassador in Kabul at the time, Bill Wood, who both he and Admiral McRaven recall a conversation uh, that the two of them had uh, in late 2008 or early 2009 that I describe in the book where essentially um, uh, Ambassador Wood, you know, calls McRaven to the woodshed and says, "Hey, you guys are losing the war for us with all these with all these civilian casualties um, and all these all these night raids where you kill too many people. And even if it's the right people, it allows the Taliban the opportunity to claim civilian casualties. Uh, and, and this sort of uh, compels McRaven to uh, impose reforms on the JSOC task force, make them work better with conventional forces. Um, and they do, in fact, do that." Um, I think a, a big question would be to what degree has that kind of has that kind of um, reform persisted uh, and and jumped to other theaters, uh, you know, in, in Somalia and Syria and Iraq, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a you know there's a case to be made that in some cases it's had to be relearned uh, and and reinvented, kind of the cooperation again as we've gone into other countries, uh, and in some cases the, the that kind of reform just hasn't translated. I think Somalia is is an example of that, where you still see this kind of compartmentalization, where you did before US troops pulled out, um, compartmentalization of JSOC efforts from vanilla special operations efforts from conventional efforts with you know, nobody talking to each other uh, and lots of, lots of miscommunication uh, that has, a, has a, a really big effect on the broader mission. Great, thanks. Um. Yeah, I'd love to follow up on that with some specific questions about that operation because it's so uh, it's so interesting, and I, I had some 
um, you know, my mind was wondering sort of as you were reporting on this and, and writing about it, sort of what the interaction was between other depictions of, of the operation as told by uh, Marcus Luttrell, the, the lone survivor and kind of the timing of your book. Maybe we can come back to that if we have time a little later, just on the, the mechanics of all this, because um, it was really uh, it was really interesting to kind of read, read uh, that chapter. Um, but I don't want to lose the opportunity to kind of build on um, this topic that, that we've introduced now um, about civilian harm uh, over the course of um, the Afghanistan war, because it is, you know, for all the focus on the operations and the soldiers doing the fighting, it is a pretty um, consistent, persistent theme throughout um, the course of the book, you know, starting with some of the, the devastating civilian casualties incidents that took place uh, early on, one in particular uh, involving, um, I think, a, a Marine unit. Um, uh, uh, Jamie Wolf, I think, was uh, the the Marine who, who came across, um, you know, uh, a, a set of um, of civilians who had been killed uh, quite unintentionally, and then building all the way up to more recent circumstances um, that you describe in your chapter on, on Haymaker. Um, I kind of, um, you know, took away as someone who focuses on this issue, kind of two persistent themes throughout. In the earlier parts of the book. Um, I think it was really fascinating and I think uh, a good contribution to our understanding of these issues. One, kind of how over time the accumulation of harm developed a kind of um, scar tissue on, on both sides. I mean, with Afghanistan uh, and with Afghans, um, you got to the point where it wasn't, you couldn't treat any one incident in isolation. It had to be um, dealt with almost uh, in the context of all the incidents that came before it and this kind of deep seated antipathy. Uh, that built up over time and resentment really for uh, for the presence of the U.S. there, uh, which really comes through in the way you describe uh, Afghan responses, uh, both in at the political level, but also just uh, in the way civilians like would look at and talk about, uh, you know, U.S. forces. Um, but the other, um, you know, themes that come through later in the book really, I think, serve to validate a lot of, uh, you know, civics work and the attention we try to call to uh, the dangers of assigning a kind of mythological precision and perfection to drone warfare uh, and the problems really associated with being overconfident in, in any claims that can be made about, you know, the certainty of no civilian casualties from, uh, from airstrikes. Um, but it does also, even in those sections, get into some things I was less familiar with, which might be interesting uh, to our audience and readers. Um, you talk a little bit about like the reprisals that were carried out by uh, the Taliban against suspected informants, which I sort of knew about, but not in the level of depth that, that you kind of get into. So, you know, apart from some of those those takeaways, I wonder if you could comment now on, um, you know, what you think your readers and what we as the, the public and the policy community dealing with, with these issues might take away from the experience and apply to experiences going forward, especially as you know, in the way you describe a lot of the incidents and in, in the U.S. reaction, um, there was an impulse to maybe change tactics or to do something differently. Um, but quite often as a result of kind of a strategic uh, imperative. So if you could just offer thoughts and, and, and things that we might carry forward to the next uh, uh, situation, that'd be great. Had the best of intentions, and that all may be true, uh, but they add up over time. Uh, I'll give the example of the, the first um, death of a civilian at U.S. hands that I'm aware of in the Tetch uh, was in the spring of 2004. There's a Green Beret team. Um, the Green Beret team, is, they're the first guys to live out in Nangalam, the, the, you know, the main town in the Tetch at, at a base there. Um, and they have a very good relationship with the population. Um, and they're out on patrol one day and the Green Beret captain, um, you know, a, a big dog comes up at him, like, a, you know, one of these big kind of mangy village dogs that you see that are pretty menacing. Um, and so he shoots the dog, you know, which is a, a pretty reasonable response um, when you when you have a that they've been writers, um, you know, explain to the people, hey, look, the guy who did this was Commander Ron. You all know him. He's a good guy. This was an honest mistake. Um, and it and it and it blows over. Uh, people kind of people forgive it. Um, it the the Green Beret captain goes and apologizes to the family. He you know he he, he consults with uh, local leaders about what's the kind of the appropriate way to apologize and express his condolences. Uh, and people move on. But new units keep coming in, and the same thing keeps happening. Um, so, you know, by the time, you know, 2010, when I first visited the Petch, uh, you have these villages that, you know, Candigal village at the mouth of the Korangal, um, 
they just have a litany of these incidents that they can that they can look back on. Um, you know, one from this unit, one from the unit before that, one from the unit before that. Uh, often these were things that would happen kind of early on in units tours. Uh, we talk a lot about sort of how dangerous the um, the first few weeks or first few months in theater were for for U.S. units, but those were also very dangerous times for the people dealing with U.S. units. Um, which I think is kind of a you know a, a lesson that I hadn't really heard talked about, but was one that came up in my reporting is that a lot of the civilian casualty incidents would happen early on in units tours. Um, uh, and, but you know eventually uh, you know a new unit comes in and uh, it, 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 there's some escalation of force incident, they act on bad intelligence, something like that happens. Uh, and it's just as much of a good faith mistake as the one that this Green Beret captain made in 2004. But people are absolutely do not have that kind of reservoir of, hey, look, uh, we understand what you meant um, because they've just they've been dealing with it for so long, um, and it's it maybe it's the first one for this unit, but it's not the first one for them. Um, so I think that's that's one of the one of the big takeaways for me was the degree to which these kind of uh, the same kinds of civilian casualty incidents uh, began to have more and more outsized effects as people just got totally fed up with them. Um, Another one that I'd point out is the way that both the behavior of U.S. forces reflected on the Afghan government and the behavior of the Afghan government reflected on U.S. forces. Um, you know, one of the incidents that I talk about in the book and reconstruct is an event in 2003 uh, where uh, U.S. aircraft um, killed a large portion of a family up in the Weigal Valley um, in a strike where they had been fed uh, very faulty intelligence by members of the NDS, the Afghan Intelligence Service. Um, and I interviewed a lot of members of this family. And something that was really interesting to me was that uh, they were not too angry at the United States about this strike. Uh, they were really angry at the NDS about this strike um, and about and at specific people in the NDS who they believed had deliberately fed the United States false intelligence. Um, so I, mean, I think there can be a lot of nuance to kind of how these events are perceived on the ground uh, and, and you know, how people think of why they happened. Um, but really, the, you know, one of the takeaways that you see, uh, especially as the US moves on uh, to very much drone-based warfare, air-based warfare uh, in the patch, in the post-2012 post period during what they call Operation Haymaker, um, is that your, your strikes are as good as your intelligence. Um, so, you know, in the in the 2000 in the post 2012 period, uh, as the U.S. is conducting, you know, the Joint Special Operations Command is running these very frequent drone strikes up there in a campaign that never got quite as much attention as you know the CIA effort on the other side of the border in Pakistan, but was kind of similar in in pace and intensity. Um, the, the military gets really good at these strikes. It gets really good at um, only hitting the people that it wants to hit. It, it gets really good at, you know, it, it, in some ways the terrain is really bad for these strikes in this kind of surveillance because of the vegetation, um, because of the mountains, because of the weather. But in other ways it's good for it because they're not, it's not the built up urban area. Uh, and they really can kind of, if they're patient, they can wait and strike a guy in the mountainside when it's just him and his bodyguard. Um, and they would do that a lot. Um, but it's something that, uh, you know, Afghans from some of these affected villages would talk to me about. I'm thinking here about um, Afghans from the Weigal Valley who were not at all shy about telling me about their previous experiences with civilians and women and children killed in, you know, the 2003 airstrike that I mentioned earlier. Um, but uh, many of them gave the United States credit for the precision of its strikes uh, during Operation Haymaker. Um, it, you know, th there was guys from uh, Iran in the Weigal Valley told me that during the whole course of this kind of post-2011, 2012 onward drone war, they couldn't think of an instance where a woman or child had been killed in any of the strikes. Um, but they nevertheless were very critical of who the strikes were killing um, because they said that, you know, a lot of what a lot of it was, um, uh, strikes that would wind up, you know, they, they might kill the Taliban figure that they were targeting, um, but it would also kill the two military-aged male fighters who were with him. And even if those were kind of legitimate targets, which they would acknowledge that they were, this nevertheless uh, would kind of strengthen the position of the Taliban in town um, by, by turning people against, uh, you know, the United States for, for killing these two local guys. Uh, and another effect that they described uh, was the way these strikes uh, kind of shaped the insurgency. Um, where the strikes would, you know, kill out, kill a local Taliban commander whom people had worked out, you know, an understanding with. People were able to live with this Taliban commander, and then the new guy who came in 
uh, might be a more kind of vicious character um, was a phenomenon that they that people would describe to me. Um, and, and also these uh, these strikes would you know as, uh, as Dan you alluded to they really they would prompt um, very vicious spy hunting campaigns. Uh, which were probably responsible for more civilian deaths during Operation Haymaker than the strikes themselves were responsible for. Um, as the Taliban uh, sort of tried to root out uh, people at, you know, where the intelligence was coming from that was prompting these strikes. Now, very often the intelligence was actually entirely technical intelligence. Um, you know, stuff the military is watching on its full motion video feeds all the time, it's tracking cell phones, but nevertheless, the Taliban is kind of looking for an outlet and is paranoid. Um, and so it'll just drag people off and try them and execute them in these kind of kangaroo courts in the mountains, often torturing them first. Um, uh, and so th this winds up being, you know, one of, one of the big effects uh, of Haymaker in these villages uh, is that it, it really, it makes it a very difficult place to live um, for people under the thumb of the Taliban. Um, well, Wes, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned Haymaker because that's actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about. And, and as I was reading the book over uh, in the past few weeks, obviously I was, um, consuming it with the coming or the ongoing U.S. withdrawal in mind um, and trying to think about how um, what you observed and you, what you chronicle in the book, how, what that can sort of tell us about Afghanistan's future. Um, and so I want to ask you what you think, um, you know, and as everybody knows, the U.S. is going to be out of Afghanistan uh, supposedly entirely um, in terms of the military presence in the next few months, but will retain um, some sort of CT operation. We don't know yet the details, but I'm hoping you can talk to us about two things. One, what do you think um, Haymaker and you know the the shift to this largely um, air airborne uh, uh, CT mission at that stage in the conflict in the in the Pesh? What does that tell us? What what can we draw from that experience um, about the future? CT operation in Afghanistan and what the United States can and can't do and what the, you know, how that, uh, what ripple effects that actually has on the security and social situation in Afghanistan. And then I also think it might be helpful for the audience if you can just give us a quick update on what the situation in the Pesh is today. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, as one, um, you know, important area that people are going to have to be thinking about even after the U.S. withdraws. Sure. Yes, yeah, so Operation Haymaker was this effort by the Joint Special Operations Command. They started it in late 2011. It really kicked, you know, gained steam in 2012 and lasted through 2016 when they finally killed its main target, Farouk al Qatani. But it then was almost seamlessly replaced by a very similar drone operation going after ISIS elements that were popping up in Kunar. But it was basically, it was a drone campaign um, uh, designed by General Joe Votel, who was the JSOC commander in 2011. Um, basically because he was tired of losing guys up in these mountains and of risking helicopters up in these mountains. Um, and the tactics and technology of drones, which had been very, very imperfect early in the war, um, had really matured tremendously by 2012 um, to the point where it was possible to do this kind of aerial manhunting campaign. Um, and you know, despite the, you know, the drawbacks that I was just alluding to, I mean, I think the big picture about Haymaker is that it was a pretty successful, it was a pretty successful effort. Um, it took a long time, in part because during a kind of kill-only campaign like that, you're never getting prisoners to interrogate. Uh, the kind of, the kind of uh, information that you're getting is never as good as, as the information of, you know, when you're doing commando raids on the ground. Um, but nevertheless, it did, it, it, you know, it, it basically wore down and destroyed this little Al-Qaeda Al cell that was, that was operating up there that had been a, a cell of great concern to, you know, members of Obama's national security team. Um, it, it's the kind of effort that it's probably going to be very hard to replicate, I think, in a post-withdrawal Afghanistan, because, you know, you think about it as, okay, it's just aircraft flying, uh, flying, over, the, flying over the mountains. We should be able to keep doing that. Uh, but it's not as simple as that. It's, um, th these, these are, you know, the, it wasn't just drones, but it was very heavily reliant on, uh, on drones and on small turboprop surveillance planes that were full of signals intelligence gear. And these are not um, aircraft that have long legs. Um, these are aircraft that were flying in from Jalalabad airfield for the most part, to some extent Bagram. Um, and they would stay up for you know, eight, 10, 12 hours at a time. But the reason they were able to do that is because they were commuting a fairly short distance um, from, from Jalalabad and Bagram. Uh, these, are not, these are not aircraft that you, can, that you can fly in from the Gulf or, or fly off a carrier. Um, 
and you know, and even if you can, I mean, there are there are extended range uh, versions of, of the Reaper that are pretty common now. Uh, but you're you're gonna you're gonna need many more of the drones to create the same effect because you can't keep them for eight hours on station. Maybe you can keep them for two or four or six hours on station, but it's never gonna be as much as when you're flying from within the country. Um, depending on what the Biden administration works out in terms of regional basing, um, I think that will kind of that will be the determining factor in you know, the degree to which the U.S. is able to keep this kind of 24-7 surveillance effort uh, that underpinned uh, Operation Haymaker and, and efforts like it. Um, you know, if there's, if there's a base somewhere nearby, if they work out, you know, a base in Pakistan or Uzbekistan, th that's, you know, that creates more opportunities for this kind of effort than if we're just flying in from the Gulf and from carriers. And let me just um, back up and, uh, and ask you, so if you were saying that, that the intelligence that drove those strikes in Haymaker were largely you know, derived by technical means, by ISR and SIGINT, does that mean that the lack of a U.S. ground presence doesn't matter, setting aside the aircraft problem and the um, uh, time on target uh, problem, like, does that mean that you know, that's actually not an impediment? Um, I don't think it's a big impediment to uh, the, the Haymaker type stuff. I mean, there certainly was a human intelligence aspect uh, of Haymaker that we don't know much about, um, but which I think was coming much more from the CIA's side of the house than from the military side of the house. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, these, these, were, these were remote operations um, driven, driven in large part by aerial surveillance and, and, and signals intelligence. Um, so yeah, in, in, in some sense, we've already been operating without a ground presence for quite a long time. Um, I mean, in Kunar and Nuristan, U.S. troops have been out of there for the most part since 2014. Um, and not, not a lot is changing now as a result of this decision in that part of the country. Um, but the, you know, the, the, when Jalalabad airfield goes away and when Bagram airfield goes away and the ability to fly platforms from, from within the country goes away, um, I think the, the ability to know what's going on, even using those kind of remote technical means, is going to go down pretty dramatically. And I think it already has gone down very dramatically. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about, well, what's up, how are we going to know what Al Qaeda is up to, you know, post September, post withdrawal? How will we know what they're doing? I think we already have huge blind spots in Afghanistan um, about what Al Qaeda is doing um, because our presence is so much smaller now. We have so many fewer platforms flying around over the country. Um, we have so many fewer intelligence people out at little outposts in the countryside. Um, I, I think we're probably, in some ways, closer now to what we're going to see uh, in, in terms of intelligence gaps and ability to understand what Al-Qaeda is up to um, than we are to the situation that existed five or 10 years ago. And maybe can you just talk us, uh, to us a little bit about the situation, the dynamics in the Pesh today, um, just to set the stage for everyone thinking about what um, the, the post drawdown uh, period sure. might look like? So, um, the Pesh is unusual in that it has this, this Salafi population in, in Kunar and, and Nuristan um, who have kind of uh, become uh, a natural recruiting target for ISIS's Afghan branch. So in that part of the country, unlike many other parts of the country, it's really a three-way war um, between the Taliban, the government, and ISIS. And they're all fighting each other, but the Taliban and the government are also working out accommodations with one another um, to go after ISIS. Um, in recent years, you've seen actually even you know well before the Doha deal, um, you saw uh, the government and the Taliban um, declaring formal local truces um, uh, so that the two of them could could sort of coordinate their operations against ISIS uh, and help root ISIS out. Uh, that that pocket of ISIS control up in the valleys, just the mountains and valleys just south of the Pech, um, that has been pretty substantially reduced over the past two years. So I think the question is, well, okay, so this kind of stasis that the Taliban and the government had worked out up there, which was very different from, um, you know, the brutal conflict that you saw the Taliban and the government pursuing everywhere else in the country, uh, will that last um, or will they go right back at it? I mean, and will it become kind of a bloodbath again between, between the Taliban and the government um, that was kind of, you know, a bloodbath that was being avoided because ISIS was there uh, presenting this complicating factor that forced them to work together. Um, there have been, you know, a, a couple of friends of mine, um, you know, fellow journalists, our friend TM was up in the patch back in, uh, it was February or March um, from the New York Times. Uh, and he described like a pretty quiet situation. Um, but since then, uh, a little later in March, there was a mass Taliban attack on a district center in the Western patch. Um, you know, why that is, I don't know. Um, but it's, 
you know, I, I, I think um, it's, it's hard to see Kunar or the Pech being strategically important places for the Taliban in the months or years ahead. Uh, when they have, you know, as we know, there is there is fighting at the gates of Lashkargah, actually inside the city of Lashkargah now in the south. Um, and these places in the Taliban heartland, I think, are far more important to the Taliban uh, than Kunar is. So it may be that kind of this 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 quiet period persists in Kunar. Uh, I don't know. Okay, great, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Wes. And uh, we have a couple of questions coming in in the chat, but before we go there. Um, you had said something a little earlier about, um, you know, part of the drive to move to the air campaign was motivated by the experience of a lot of these commanders uh, in losing forces. And you talked throughout the later sections of the book on, on how many of those people who served in, you know, as lieutenant colonels and colonels in Afghanistan kind of rose up to, to generals and, and then later oversaw other campaigns. And I'm thinking most specifically about inherent resolve. And, and Missy, you've done some work on this as well. And it just occurred to me to ask you sort of, you know, we've only, I mean, tragically, but, you know, we've only lost 21 total uh, U.S. forces uh, in, in, the, uh, in the fight against ISIS in Iraq and Syria in the last couple of years. And I wonder, um, you know, it's purely speculation, um, but would you offer any thoughts on sort of whether you think um, the ground war in Afghanistan kind of informed the way we approached later campaigns in terms of the preference for the use of air power over putting U.S. forces uh, in harm's way, or whether or not you think that was just these have been more purely motivated by, you know, operational concerns for how best to to wage those campaigns. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the ground wars, both in Afghanistan and in Iraq, maybe even more so in Iraq, um, really drove this shift to to aerial targeting, uh, which you know, at the same time that you saw the aerial targeting approach um, coming up uh, in Haymaker in in Nuristan, you also saw it coming up at the same time, also through the Joint Special Operations Command in Yemen and Somalia in 2012 and 2013. So I think, you know, what drives this aerial targeting um, can vary. Uh, I think in Kunar and Nuristan, it was very much the terrain um, and kind of the practical fear of, of casualties that Joint Special Operations Command officers felt um, as a result of their bad experiences with that terrain. I think in Yemen and Somalia, it was, um, you know, a, a, a diff it was much more kind of political considerations of not wanting to lose U.S. troops on commando raids in countries where we're not supposed to be at war. Um, but it's still, it's the same. It's, uh, you know, places where you, um, places where you don't, you, you don't feel like it's worth losing guys. Um, uh, this, the, 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 the air campaign presents a really attractive, uh, presents a really attractive uh, other option. Um, you know, it's when I say the air campaign, that's of course an air campaign that is uh, existing kind of enmeshed with the continuing ground war that our allies on the ground are fighting. And so it's by no means really just an air campaign, right? Um, so some of the strikes that the that JSOC has been conducting uh, against ISIS up in the patch, um, they've always been kind of tied in with, oh, well, what's the ANA doing? Um, but in, in, in recent years, like in the six months preceding the Doha deal, for instance, as I described in the epilogue of the book, um, JSOC was actually kind of paying attention to what the Taliban needed in its fight against ISIS uh, and, and using the Taliban as a de facto um, surrogate force uh, against ISIS and kind of using the same old signals intelligence tools to listen into the Taliban, not in order to figure out who to kill, um, but in order to figure out what the Taliban needed before they, you know, crossed the line of departure and went up the hill against ISIS the next day, uh, which was a pretty fascinating development that I, I think caused some cognitive dissonance and strange feelings for members of the JSOC task force. Sorry, I'm going to uh, read out some audience questions, but before Great. I do, I just want to ask one thing um, that I have uh, spent a lot of time wondering about it. I'm curious to get your thoughts um, as we were making the comparison between the air wars in Iraq and Syria and then Afghanistan. You know, OIR had this, um, you know, sort of remarkable level of, um, if very, very imperfect, um, remarkable level of uh, 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 of accountability to some extent about the civilian casualties and of transparency regarding the the um, 
the actual pace and locations of the airstrikes. And Dan um, and I, have, you know, of course, um, have talked a lot about the significant shortcomings of that process. But in comparison to other military operations by the United States, um, and and also, you know, by the uh, in comparison to the way that U.S. allies are still operating in Iraq and Syria, it has been pretty remarkable. It, um, but the situation in the Afghanistan campaign is so different, and there's been so actually, you know, so little information systemically about civilian casualties and, and also a um, decreasing level of transparency about airstrikes. And I'm just wondering, what, uh, why do you think that is? And is, is it, uh, were there um, uh, clues that you came across in your reporting that might explain that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I, I don't have a great answer for it because the book doesn't focus as heavily on the past few years. But yeah, I mean, the fact is that the air campaign over the past like two to three years in Afghanistan is a black hole of information. Um, especially if you compare it to OIR. I'm seeing my internet connection is unstable, so I hope that um, I'll just we keep talking. Um, uh, we know that the pace of airstrikes increased massively um, starting in 2017 and then even more so in 2018 and 2019 uh, in Afghanistan as the U.S. military um, shifted from kind of doing these, you know, uh, you know, much more focused on we're going after ISIS, we're going after Al-Qaeda leaders, back into, we're going after every Taliban figure that we can find, and we're just gonna make life hard for them on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, the, the military does still, you know, it has this annual report where it, uh, you know, where, where, where it puts out the rough locations and, uh, 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 and dates of strikes where it found there to be, uh, you know, credible civilian casualty allegations in Afghanistan. That was actually useful to me. I was able to match some of those incidents um, to particular uh, incidents that my interview uh, subjects had described in Kunar in recent years, so it's not nothing. Um, but of course, those are only the, the, the allegations that the military itself has deemed credible. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's totally unlike OIR in that way. Um, you know, why this is, I mean, I, I would guess, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm thinking more back on, you know, my, my uh, time reporting on this, you know, for the news rather than for the book. I mean, I, I would guess that a lot of it was to keep the Afghan war away from President Trump's attention. Um, would be is sort of my, my, my built-in guess, um, was that uh, the military felt like it needed to massively escalate the air campaign in 2018 and 2019, um, but it always knew that it could have the rug pulled out from it at any second, um, and that it did not have, you know, that more attention uh, on this air campaign uh, might, be, might be worse. That's my guess. Okay. Um, I'm going to read a question from Mark uh, Garlasco. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, and the question is, do you see a link between civilian casualties and radicalization? What about um, accountability, lack of accountability, and radicalization? I guess um, I assume that he's getting to accountability for civilian casualties. Right. Um, as far as radicalization, I, I don't know that I could really draw a link. I mean, I think there is there is religious radicalization has been occurring in the Petra Valley and its tributaries since the 1960s. Um, you know, there is, it's, it's, it's a fact that in recent years, basically since 2015, ISIS has showed up in, in these valleys and it didn't exist there before, of course. Um, whether that has, what that has to do with civilian casualties and kind of, you know, hardening against the U.S. presence over the years versus what that has to do with uh, the fact that this base population up in Kunar is this Salafi population that is receptive to ISIS anyway, I think is hard to tease out. Um, and I, and I, I don't think I would, I would hazard a guess about it. Um, I can, you know, I can, I can see both of those being pretty big factors in, in the rise. Uh, and then, you know, we've seen subsequently decline uh, of ISIS up in this part of the country. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was thinking about as I was reading is that how much I would have loved to have seen, you know, we were talking about the cumulative effect of civilian casualties. Um, I would love to have seen some sort of longitudinal study of um, views of people um, in uh, the Pesh uh, towards the U.S. military. And I'm uh, wondering, do you, did, did the U.S. military have, how much information did the U.S. military have itself have on, um, you know, the sentiment, sentiments of local people? Um, I think not a lot. I mean, I think there was, you know, there was national level polling that the military commissioned and was doing, but I, I certainly never heard, um, you know, U.S. battalion commanders in my interviews refer to, you know, polling that they had about what people thought of them in the patch 
um, it was much more, I mean, which isn't to say that these US commanders didn't have a sense of how they were perceived. I mean, I think um, in 2010 and 2011, um, when uh, the, the, the battalion commander in the Pesha Valley at that point, Joe Ryan, who's actually back in Kabul now as a, a one star on his, on his eighth Afghanistan tour, uh, help, helping oversee the withdrawal, I mean, part of what really led him to decide, hey, this isn't working, I need to recommend to my commanding officers that we pull out of this place, um, was just the sense that he got insurance, um, the sense that he got meeting with people, um, that people were just cold to the US presence. Um, I mean, I think that was just something that he kind of understood intuitively um, in, in his daily interactions with, with Afghans. So, I, you know, I, I think the lack, of, the lack of polling is perhaps, you know, not necessarily indicative of yeah. these commanders, especially back at the peak of things when guys actually were living out there with people, their ability to understand, you know, what people thought of them. But going back to our early points about the um, rotational, uh, the problems with the rotational nature of the U.S. military presence, has the military gotten better at conveying those lessons um, you know, over time? Sure. I think in some ways the military has, um, but I think also in some ways the nature of the mission has changed so much yeah. that um, it's, it's just, it's like apples to oranges. I mean, the, the fact that we don't have battalions out in the fight in a district anymore, kind of living in this granular information, collecting granular information, you know, needing granular information, like that's no longer the situation. We now have, you know, special operations teams that cover much broader areas. I think probably, um, you know, units are much better at passing information down now, but it's a very different kind of information. It's much more, it's much less detailed um, and much, uh, yeah, and, and much, much broader. You know, we look at, you know, the Ranger battalions, they rotate through Afghanistan uh, and they're extraordinarily good at passing information down from one battalion to the other because it's the same three battalions rotating back and forth every three to four months, year after year after year. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they're very good at, at, uh, at passing information, but we're talking about a, a battalion task force that's responsible for the entire country. Um, so that's, it's a whole different kind of information. I do think it's relevant though, as you know, the US, uh, even as the sort of larger counter um, terrorism post 9-11 era winds down, um, you know, in Iraq and Syria, you know, the US is still working with the you know, Kurdish forces and with the Iraqi mm -hmm. forces. And you can see where that might still pose a problem as, you know, the relative importance of their abilities to fight um, you know, extremist threats in their countries becomes more important. Sure. Um, and something that I've been thinking a lot recently is, I mean, the odds are not zero, they may be low, but the odds are not zero that the US military winds up ha going back and having a more involved role in Afghanistan um, than, than what it's preparing to have. Uh, and, and so I wonder, you know, wh I mean, where will the repository for that knowledge be? Like, it's, is, it, is it still gonna be, is the Ranger Regiment still gonna be, uh, kind of have Afghanistan in its blood and is it in its memory? Um, maybe, uh, maybe not. Um, if, if the mission scales down and it's not the Ranger Regiment's responsibility to do CT there anymore, then, you know, then, then where will this knowledge be? Um, you know, when U.S. forces went back into Iraq in 2014, um, after having been gone for, what, two and a half, three years, something like that, um, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of knowledge had already been lost. Uh, and, and units often had to kind of um, uh, really dig to find information about the places they were going back to. Kind of the saving grace was a lot of the same people were going back. I mean, you think about guys like Sean McFarland, who had been a brigade commander in Iraq and then was the three star there and in 2015, 2016, whatever it was. Um, and because the U.S. military has spent so much time in Afghanistan, I think it's almost inevitable that, uh, that th there will be commanders who, uh, in, in any, any future efforts involving Afghanistan, there will be commanders who have personal experience there. But that's, I mean, that's not good enough, right? It's not, um, that's not, that's not records of granular information that can be, that can be shared. Um, and I think the, the military has the capacity to keep that information if it wants to. Like, you know, that 10, 10, 15 years ago, there were physical problems with it. Like they're just, the hard drives weren't big enough and they'd have to write over their hard drives as units rotated through Afghanistan. That's not the case today. So I think if the military really wants to um, retain um, and organize and use it's information from this whole experience in Afghanistan, it can if it wants to. Um, but things like the dissolution of the asymmetric warfare group, um, which was a, always a repository for institutional knowledge, um, are, probably don't bode well for that. Okay, we have one more question that I'm gonna um, read out and it's from Kate Martin um, who asks, can you describe what threat um, the Al-Qaeda cell in those valleys posed to the United States beyond that to the soldiers who were actually there? Yeah, I mean, so it didn't really pose any threat to the soldiers who were actually there because there weren't any. 
Um, you know, the period that we're looking at when JSOC was going after Farouk al Qatani and his guys was after the U.S. pullout um, from the Pech. Um, you know, there, he, it's, it's believed that he had some involvement in uh, some suicide bombings that happened in the provincial capital. But the, the concern that people had about Farouk al Qatani was that he was involved in um, external operations plots um, in, involving, you know, a, a lot of it we don't know about because a lot of the information is still classified. But, you know, what, what, what it's been described to me is that uh, the concern was that Farouk al Qatani was bringing Pakistani nationals with British passports. Um, up into up into these mountains north uh, north of the Pesh Valley, um, and training them for some purpose. Um, and I don't think the military really knew much more than that. I mean, it's possible that they did, um, but it was kind of uh, in some ways, he, he, Farouk al Qatani was kind of this Rorschach test, where you could different parts of the military and the intelligence community projected different things onto him. And he was a great example of um, just how the absence of knowledge can be. A, a, you know, can drive this kind of military impulse to action as much as the presence of knowledge does. I mean, they had some tantalizing clues about the fact that he might be involved in serious external operations. But so how much effort does that warrant, right? Uh, and, and that was a debate throughout the later part of the Obama administration. I mean, how much effort does this sell up there warrant? Um, and there were people like, uh, you know, Michael Morell, uh, the deputy director of the CIA at the time, um, was, was, you know, very concerned about Farouk al-Qahtani and thought he warranted quite a lot of effort especially when the effort we're talking about is, you know, drones and stuff, um, which, which were sort of pretty sustainable from his perspective. Um, but, you know, from, from the perspective of some of the, some of the, the Ranger commanders who were, who were actually running the strikes, they thought, well, I don't know, like, is this guy that big of a deal? I mean, we've got him pinned down up there. He's hemmed up in these little villages. Like, what could he really be doing? But then that, of course, then poses the other question, like, okay, well, so maybe he's not that big of a threat, but maybe that's only because we've got him hemmed down up there with, with this drone campaign. Um, so, I, I mean, in, in some ways, that's kind of the a core question of this is like you're dealing with you're hunting covert networks that don't want you to know what they're doing. Um, and you're doing it um, through signals intelligence and full motion video, much less so than you are with like penetration agents or something like that. Um, so you're never going to know what they're up to. Uh, so it becomes a question of how much risk are you willing to accept? And I think that's exactly um, the question that's crystallizing right now, um, you know, because of the drawdown and uh, it does come down to risk tolerance. And obviously um, Biden and the White House, I think have a different uh, perspective on that than, than the Pentagon. Um, so, you know, I, I think the- And something I would add on that subject is, um, you know, one of the lessons of the book is that not all Al Qaeda operatives in Afghanistan are created equal. Right, like Farouk al Qatani drew in this presence because there were these real hints that he was an external operations guy. Um, but the guy that he kind of replaced uh, was a guy named Abu Ikhlas, an Egyptian who US, the US military was hunting for years and years and years. And when they finally got him and talked to him, he doesn't appear to have had anything to do with external operations. He appears to have been essentially an Al Qaeda Green Beret. I mean, he was, he was out there doing battlefield advising. And so we know now, I mean, we see, we see hints of an Al-Qaeda presence in all kinds of southern provinces where we didn't see hints of an Al-Qaeda presence before. I mean, the, the NDS and special operations units keep, keep grabbing these guys or killing these guys, you know, Egyptians in Helmand or Ghazni. Um, but I think it's a really important question, like, okay, so Al-Qaeda is there, but what kind of Al-Qaeda is it? Because the external operations mission and the battlefield advising mission have always existed together within Al-Qaeda. Um, and so yeah, how, do you, how do you know kind of how much effort is warranted, right? Because if, if you're trying to kill every Al-Qaeda operative in Afghanistan, that's a fool's errand. Uh, and you're also going to wind up killing a lot of guys who are essentially these battlefield advisors like Abu Iqlas and wasting time and effort doing that. Um, so yeah, I think that's one of the big questions that we certainly, I certainly hope the Pentagon and the administration are going to be grappling with is what is the real nature of the Al-Qaeda presence? Are these and people Farouk al Qatanis or are they Abu Ikhlasis? And it probably also goes to the capability of the Afghan institutions now um, that the U.S. has tried to build, um, and you know how effectively they're they themselves are able to you know make that assessment. Sure, and they're also we're also going to be relying very much on them right. um, for exactly. you know for the intelligence, and of course you know they are not disinterested parties as they present that intelligence to us. Well, I, um, I'm going to hand it over to Dan. I have to hop off here, but I just want to say again how much I enjoyed the book, um, and uh, I really learned a lot, and um, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to take part in this conversation, and everybody should buy the book, so. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thank All you right. so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. We'll, we'll be in Here. touch. Bye -bye.
And for everybody in the audience, uh, Wes has agreed to stick around for uh, for any remaining um, you know questions or or even uh, points that that folks in the audience uh, who might be lurking with that like really important point they want to make uh, to do so now. Um, but so I'll go ahead and, and monitor here the, the chat here for a second um, while I ask uh, you know sort of my own question of Wes, which is more to do with kind of what your plans are going forward. You've written this uh, this life's work, <laughs> which anybody would be happy with. It was the last book they wrote, but something tells me that you're not done. So what uh, what does the future hold for you? I have a couple of projects um, kind of in the early stages, but nothing that I'm kind of that I'm that's at a point where I'm comfortable talking about it. Okay. But I'm not done with Afghanistan, and I'm not done with. Um, you know, the, the role of U.S. forces in Afghanistan, uh, even going back some time, you know, th I think there's a lot of stories to be explored from from all this, all this 20 years of U.S. effort there. Yeah, and I think that's what, um, you know, I came away from the book. It's almost at times like it's such a well-written book, but at times it's like it's hard to keep going because it is like a detailed description in some cases, like a really like, you know, uh, tragic circumstances and um, at a very tactical level, but I, when I came away from it, I was like, what does this all tell us as a country about our experience in Afghanistan and what might that, that offer for the future? I, so, so I think people will be wrestling with what the implications of your, uh, what your, the story you've told will be for some time. Um, in the meantime, we do have um, a question uh, coming in from Jenny McAvoy, um, who asks, um, would you mind speaking further about the dynamics of the learning curve on civilian casualties uh, awareness and the scale and trends, as well as on the effectiveness uh, of measures me measures to mitigate harm. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think um, the 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 effectiveness of civilian casualty mitigation measures um, is something that was very different at different parts of the war, right? Because the, the U.S. presence looked so different at different stages, right? Like when you have 700 infantrymen living out at little outposts scattered throughout the Petch Valley and its tributaries, um, that presents a lot more kind of points of risk, basically. Um, for, for, the, for there to be civilian casualties then later on when it's just, there are no troops on the ground, there are no firefights that airstrikes are intervening in. Um, and it's all these kind of these precision strikes that are, uh, that, that are you know, significant surveillance occurs before. So that's one side of the equation. I mean, you know, the, an example I'd give is um, just in these little villages along the Petch Valley floor along the road, there would be recurring instances of, you know, many of the civilian casualties would occur not from airstrikes, but from, mortar rounds falling short from either side. You know, US mortar rounds falling short, Taliban mortar rounds falling short. Um, they'd occur from Taliban IEDs going off and killing people that they weren't meant to kill. Um, they'd occur from, you know, jittery US troops early in their deployment, um, having a car driving at them uh, and, and, you know, and opening fire. Um, so a, a lot of the civilian casualties over the years in the patch occurred from that kind of thing rather than from kind of more dramatic incidents like an AC-130 strike that kills a whole bunch of people all at once, although those certainly happened. Um, the, the flip side of that, though, is that when there, are, when there were troops on the ground, um, th there was other, type, other types of information and intelligence and touch points out there, um, just as, you know, just platoon leaders and platoon sergeants and their interpreters talked with the population and got to know the population. Um, that wasn't there, you know, later on when we're dealing with the remote warfare by JSOC. Um, I think Operation Haymaker, again, I mean, there, there, are, there are high profile failures. I mean, there was a, a, a September 2013 strike in Gambir in the Waterpour Valley um, that killed a whole bunch of people it wasn't meant to kill um, and, uh, you know, became a, a real a crisis point between President Karzai and, uh, and ISAF. Um, but that's an unusual incident in the story of Haymaker. Um, the, the story of Haymaker is much more about, um, you know, I think it's the story of Haymaker is much less about um, killings of, you know, inadvertent killings of women and children, which I think very few happened during Haymaker relative to the earlier years when U.S. air power was responding to firefights, um, when U.S. air power was, um, you know, hunting dynamic targets in the night and, and making mistakes in, in that kind of situation. Uh, and much more about, well, who were the kind of these, okay, legal, um, legal deliberate, you know, targets that the, that the military was killing? Who were the fighters it was killing and were they worth it? Um, and I think that, which is, I think, uh, you know, a, a related question, um, uh, but perhaps not quite one of civilian protection uh, directly. Although you can see how, like, as the, um, you know, the expansion of the target list and this idea that lower level, you know, battlefield operatives were, you know, part of the objective, um, there, there seems like there was a direct knock-on effect on, on the, 
the totality of kind of the effects on, on civilians, even the, the interpretation right. of who constituted a, a legitimate target, of course, has not only bearing on civilian harm, but also the way we, we think about, you know, what yeah. constraints the U.S. has to apply and the way it thinks about targeting. Sure. No, I would say, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, Hay Haymaker um, changed from initially going after sort of just Al-Qaeda targets um, to going after a much broader set of targets that encompassed, you know, any local fighter who'd ever had anything to do with anyone who'd ever had anything to do with Al-Qaeda. Um, you know, they, they wound up really focusing a lot after they really drove the Al-Qaeda guys underground. Um, they wound up focusing a lot on kind of uh, people like local guides yeah. um, and couriers um, who uh, in some, who probably were very crucial to Al-Qaeda, um, but who also were, you know, very much parts of, of their communities. Um, I, would, I would still say, though, that, you know, from, from my conversations with Kunari's about that period versus the period when there was an infantry battalion living out there getting in firefights, um, the, the um, I mean, we're thinking about airstrikes, but there was so much more to it than airstrikes, mm -hmm. right? Like back, back when, the, when there was an infantry battalion living and fighting in the patch, the amount of artillery that was being expended every day was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and that I think accounted for a, a, a really, really significant portion of uh, the harm that was being done to civilians mm -hmm. was the stuff that happened in this day-to-day -day fighting and in the kind of lower level fire support that happened to that fight. Um, I mean, I, I remember, you know, when I first visited Cop, Michigan in 2010, just being uh, amazed at the amount of ordnance that was being expended by both sides. Uh, and also amazed at, you know, it kind of felt like um, by that point in the war, um, the U.S. forces were so dug in on their little outposts. I mean, they had kind of built them into these concrete fortresses. And the Taliban was so dug in up on the mountains and so adept at kind of knowing, okay, we have so many minutes until the mortar shells start falling and so many minutes until the artillery shells start falling in so many minutes until the JDAMs start falling, um, that it really felt like, you know, even though it was obviously it was a war and people were dying on both sides, um, it felt like the numbers of people dying on those two sides was kind of small in comparison to the, the amount of ordnance that the two sides were expending against each other. Uh, and that, you know, kind of it was, it was in fact, because, uh, the, you know, so much of the war had shifted from the mountains down to like attacks on these outposts, um, it, it really felt like um, these these outposts, which had been established kind of to be these supposedly security bubbles, right, to push the Taliban away from the villages, and they originally had fulfilled that purpose. I mean, if you, if you look at, um, you know, not in the Korangal, but in the Petra Valley, it's proper in 2006, 2007, 2008, it seems pretty clear that they were fulfilling that purpose, and the war was not on the Pesh road, not in the Pesh villages, but by 2010, it is. Um, and so by 2010, these outposts aren't security bubbles. They're not, they, they're not providing any kind of security to these villages. If anything, they're kind of like bubbles of danger. Um, they, they're, they're drawing in fighting and violence um, toward the outposts, which of course by design had been built by the villages. Mm. Um, so I think that's you know, a pretty significant factor toward in, in the hardening of people's attitudes towards, towards so the American true. presence over the years was you know, as American troops became less risk tolerant and kind of retreated onto their outposts, um, that brought violence to the villages. It's so interesting. It's so consistent with, um, you know, the, as you know, we, we did this report on investigations and read through a lot of the earlier mm -hmm. AR-15-6, and you're right, most of those had to do with ordinance, had to do with, um, you know, shootings at checkpoints and so forth. But if anybody is interested, I think it's one of the best sources of insight about sort of some of those um, those issues just to read kind of the first person narratives that the, the investigating officers described. Um, but in any case, um, we've got a couple more questions, Wes, if you can stick around. Um, I've got one, um, you know, it's been top of mind for a lot of people and certainly for at the forefront of debate around the withdrawal, um, the effect of the withdrawal on, on women and girls uh, and human rights in the country. Um, so the attendee asks, um, do you think, do you think there will be a negative impact on women and girls uh, and human rights, um, for example, edu uh, access to education with the withdrawal, um, or is it still uh, to, be, uh, to be seen? I'm going to say still to be seen. I mean, I, I know that, um, you know, in, in the Pesh and Kunar and Nuristan, the areas that I'm most familiar with, um, we, we do know that the Taliban has, you know, it has continued, it has allowed a lot of schools to continue to exist um, in, in, in areas that it controls. In some cases, it's allowed these kind of weird arrangements where it's allowed actually the government to continue paying the salaries of, you know, the government teachers at these schools, including girls' schools. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know, um, you know, what, I'd be curious to see kind of, okay, what's, you know, how much does that, how much does that exist kind of in areas where the Taliban and the government are adjacent to each other, but not really fighting each other that hard versus, 
you know, what does the dynamic look like in areas where the Taliban and the government are adjacent, but they're really going at it versus what does it look like in areas that are very firmly under Taliban control? Uh, there was a really interesting story um, about, about a month ago from, uh, from, from Musa Kala um, in, uh, in Northern Helmand, which appears to be kind of the Taliban's capital within Afghanistan. Um, because it's so so deeply inside their territory and so far from any government lines. Um, and the reporter who went there really described the Taliban presence as not being that overt um, relative to what he saw in district centers that are kind of closer to the front lines, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm going to say I, I have a lot more. I have only questions about, you know, about that. So we have a, a, a comment slash question, which we'll, we'll use to wrap up here because we're, we're, you know, at, at a quarter after. Um, and this person uh, with, a, with a really great last name uh, makes reference to the fact that during his deployment, he found it concerning just how much of the pre-deployment efforts were internally focused. Um, that is, they worked tirelessly on how to conduct patrols, move supplies, operate equipment, very little in advance to engage in the ongoing operations in country. He had to proactively source information on areas, uh, you know, in Afghanistan, uh, Afghan history, culture, uh, even ISAF campaigns, and it was inadequate. Um, and looking back, he says, our unit trained very much in a vacuum, could have been deployed anywhere in the world and been just as unprepared. And he felt that that lack of knowledge among the general ranks um, perpetuated during or perpetuated the dehumanization of Afghanis and undermined efforts to prevent civilian harm, uh, and that most lower ranking service members had basic familiarity with ROE, and that was about it. So his question is, um, you know, are civilian programs to reduce civilian harm top down and maybe too top down by um, by inference? Um, and do you see, you know, civilian programs adequately reaching the lowest military echelons? Um, in other words, the, the so-called strategic corporal? Sure. I mean, that's a great question. And I think that comment really rings true to me. I mean, something that you saw in the patch over the years is there were units that deployed there that had, you know, a year, two years to prepare and they knew exactly where they were going. Um, but more often, that was not the case. More often, it was units that they had, you know, they knew they were going somewhere in Afghanistan, but that was about what they knew. Or in some cases, you know, there's um, the unit that saw some of the heaviest fighting, 2503 from the 173rd. They thought they were going to Iraq until very shortly before their deployment. Um, so, you know, and some of these commanders, I think, will, will, will cite this uh, as, you know, an example of why, well, we really just need to focus on sort of the basic soldier skills. Um, and to some extent, I agree. I mean, I think um, I think you're probably going to hit diminishing returns pretty quickly when you're sort of trying to train privates and specialists who are going to be driving or, or uh, pulling, you know, security on the corner or, or being in the turret of the vehicle, kind of training them in sort of cultural sensitivity when they're really never going to be kind of direct uh, interacting that directly with Afghans. Um, so I think there may have been kind of in some cases too much emphasis on the kind of well, okay, well don't point your feet this direction, and this is how you say hello, uh, and, and perhaps less on, well, okay, so we're going to Afghanistan. Let's think about who we really want to be, the squad leaders and the platoon leaders, um, and whether those guys have not so much the right knowledge, but the right attitudes. Um, because there, there absolutely were guys who, who really got it and really um, interfaced really well um, with, you know, with the people that they dealt with. Um, but often the only kind of control that, you know, a battalion commander would have, um, you know, within his unit was he could, he, could, he, could, he could pick, okay, I've got a company commander who's kind of more aggressive. I'm going to put him in the Korangal. I've got a company commander who's got the people skills. I'm going to put him in the Petch proper. And then beyond that, there was not a lot of kind of tweaking that they could do, um, you know, to, 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 pr to prepare things. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, unless you kind of really have a long lead up to know where units are going. Um, and, you know, the, the situation is very different now. I mean, we no longer have units deploy, deploying to that kind of conflict. Um, but yeah, it's always struck me that there was kind of a, there was a mismatch and a, a lot of the, a, a lot of the kind of cultural sensitivity and, and, and harm mitigation efforts um, felt directed at the wrong people, mm -hmm. um, felt like lip service, uh, felt like there were kind of other things that could have made a, a deeper difference that, but that perhaps were just counterproductive, you know, just ran totally different from how a military unit runs. I mean, it may be that you just, okay, so it, it, there may be a lieutenant in the unit who has like all the great people skills, but he just isn't, you know, he's, maybe he's not, he's just not going to be as great in combat. I don't know. I mean, it's, um, there, there are a lot of tough things going on as, 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 uh, as units prepare, you know, pick their squad leaders and platoon leaders and platoon sergeants and so on. Um, 
there's a lot a lot of considerations going in besides actually how they'll behave in the uh you know in, in the area of operations um it, it's so, yeah it's a tough one i mean it's such an interesting area of, of of exploration and understanding because you know i think there was some unintended consequences of kind of configuring the whole attitude about civilian harm within the, the kind of coin approach itself in other words kind of instrumentalizing civilian casualties as a part of like counterinsurgency and i think it bred no shortage of actually of resentment as, as resentment grew about counterinsurgency it also grew i think fatigue set in on civilian casualties and i think that's in part another potential answer to the earlier comment and question about kind of why afghanistan civilian casualties approach is different than than elsewhere i i fundamentally i've gotten the sense that a certain degree of just um resignation and fatigue has set in where um fundamentally they see it as a public affairs issue and, and if they feel like they've got a public referendum to wage a pretty serious campaign against the taliban without losing public support then they don't see a lot of uh, need to kind of really you know attend to each and every you know concern about civilian casualties that come up as long as they can um sort of refract some of the the criticism back towards the Taliban for for their responsibility for it but it is it is interesting I live about 40 miles away from Fort Leavenworth where you know I've been told pretty openly by people at you know you know combined arms center that they're actively trying to actually decondition you know new new soldiers from this mentality that they should have kind of this approach to to cultural awareness and so forth but having also just read Jim Frederick's book um you know Black Hearts about Afghanistan or Iraq I think your point about you know, just having, uh, you know, basic controls for dehumanization and kind of the kinds of things that can set in that, that, you know, allow for um, the worst kinds of expressions of violence to take place, I think is, is maybe more important than, than cultural awareness and, and Beanie Babies, which comes up a lot in your, yeah. your book. I mean, but... Something that was very striking to me was really the role that NCOs played, squad leaders, platoon sergeants, you know, company first sergeants, I mean, I think they really set the tone for their junior soldiers yeah. much more than any amount of training and blocks of instruction um, ever could. I mean, if you had if you had squad leaders who treated their Afghan counterparts with respect, that trickled down. And if you had squad leaders and you know company first sergeants who didn't, then that trickled down. I mean, that's that to me is maybe one of the most important insights we could take forward in the work that I do. But um, there's so many of those and many, many more besides uh, in your book, and we'll have this session recorded and, and we'll share with the broader audience. And I know you're doing the circuit and I hope um, everybody who's stuck around, um, you know, does take the time to, to pick up and read the book if you haven't yet. Um, and I know you've got other events coming up. Wes, you also have um, an email distribution list for the book and some other things. I don't know if you want to mention anything before we let you go, but thank you so much for, for joining us and I'll give you the last word. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I've got, um, Got a Substack newsletter that I've been doing that just um, I send out, you know, when there are reviews or when I'm doing events. Like I've got another event next week at, at Politics and Prose with Martha Raditz. And it's just uh, thehardestplace.substack.com um, if you want to check that out. Um, I also, I mean, something else that may be of interest to people, um, I've been doing a, a daily Twitter thread that I update with photos that people gave me for this book. Because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a book. It has you know, a photo insert with 25 pictures or something like that. But this is a war where everybody had digital cameras and later had smartphones. So there's an unbelievable amount of uh, fascinating visual media um, that that you know guys who fought in the Pesh gave me. So what I've been going through, what I've been doing is every day just tweeting a few new photos, uh, working forward from the beginning. You know, photos that Soviet veterans uh, gave me um, of their experiences in the '80s, and I'm up in like 2006 right now. Um, so yeah, if you just if you if you check out my Twitter. Um, that uh, my like my pinned tweet is um is is this thread um if you're ever interested in just kind of seeing what the place looked like um and I, I try to get into a little bit of some of the themes um you know for anybody who's you know not sure if they want to read 500 pages about this but maybe this could pique their interest and hopefully decide they do want to read 500 pages about this i think for the sake of the people who who you describe in the book it's it's worth taking the time to read it through and um i'll just tell you i, I saved the epilogue uh, and read it and um i just think that your comment uh, your your description of the uh you know the comments and um in response to some of the photos is just um it's really worth sticking around to read at the end it's kind of uh it leaves you with that feeling you want to get after you read a great book um so wes thank you so much i um, really look forward to staying in touch and and for all of your insights and for the audience members who stuck around thank you so much um, you know, pay attention to the work that Civilian, uh, Center for Civilians and Conflict is doing about many of these issues, and, uh, and we'll look forward to, to being in touch with all of you, but, but thanks again. Thank you. Have a good day.